All right. So just, yeah, just before we start, the news came down today that London, which is where I grew up uh, from uh, fairly shortly after I was born in Athlone, Ireland. I grew up in London and lived there until I was 11. And London has just elected its first Muslim mayor. Now, this guy, I don't know a huge amount about him, Sadiq Khan. Well, in 2001, he was the lawyer for the Nation of Islam in its successful high court bid to overturn the 15-year ban on its leader, Louis Farrakhan. In 2005 and 2008, he visited terror-charged Baba Ahmed in Woodhill Prison. He was extradited to the U.S. in 2012, serving time in prison before being returned to the U.K. in 2015. And uh, he campaigned for the release and repatriation of Britain's last Guantanamo detainee, returned to the U.K. in <clears throat> November. And London, the, the city I grew up in, now has um, about 50% of the inhabitants are foreign-born. And I will say this, um, white people, you really need to listen to this. When I was in high school, a friend of mine got involved in a political campaign. And I don't, the details aren't particularly relevant, but there was one Indian fellow from India, that kind of Indian, and he was running for office. And uh, I was down there observing, watching democracy in action. And I saw busload after busload of elderly Indian men and women coming out, couldn't hear a word of English coming from them. And all of these young Indian men were running up and down, uh, telling these people, vote here, vote here, vote here, vote for this guy, vote for this guy, vote for this guy. They didn't, of course, have any clue. I would imagine what the policies were, uh, what his platform was. They only knew one thing. They knew that the color of his skin was the same as the color of their skin. And that is a very, very important thing to understand. All they voted for was skin color. And all of that associated right, cultural history, perhaps religiosity, who knows. They voted for him because he was of their race. In America, what, 95, 97, 98 percent of blacks voted for Obama for pretty much the same reason. Now, white people have been involved in this experiment for the past 50 or 60 years. And the experiment goes something like this. We as white people will set aside all of our in-group preferences, all of our tribalistic in-group preferences to facilitate a multicultural group. Which means we are going to put principles above tribalism. We are not going to have any in-group preferences. In fact, the pendulum has swung so far the other way that whites now, in fact, have an anti-in-group preference in that they will vote for somebody who's not white in order to prove that they're not racist or not bigoted or <clears throat> to get on the multicult train. And I will tell you this. In any conflict between two groups, one group has a strong in-group preference and the other group doesn't. The group with the strong in-group preference will win. Would I like it? If we could get to a genuinely post-racial society, I sure would. I really would. But it's not happening. When England voted to, or it ended up being in front of Parliament, to vote to ban Donald Trump from the UK after he proposed limiting Muslim immigration into the U.S. I did the research at the time. And the regions which were strongest in opposing Donald Trump were Muslim regions in the U.K. It's still a strange thing for me to say. 
And I haven't seen the research. But I bet it's out there. And if you can find it, please post it in the comments below. But just off the top of your head, what percentage of Muslims do you think voted for the Muslim mayor? And what percentage of Muslims do you think voted for the white guy? You can go look it up if you want. But if the data is not there, I think we all know the answer to that one. In any conflict between two groups, one group has an in-group preference and the other group doesn't, the in-group preference group will always win. To understand this in a visceral way, well, what the heck, I'll even use a British analogy. Soccer, or football as it's known in England, is the game where You kick balls around and try and get it into the other team's net. Now, imagine you have two teams. The C team and the M team. Now, the C team will pass to everyone. But the M team will only pass to themselves. In fact, the C team will pass to the M team more often than it passes to the C team. So I've got the ball, you pass it to the other team more often even than you pass it to your own team, whereas the M team will only pass to their own players. Now you don't have to know a lot about sports to know which team is going to win. White culture since the days of Socrates, even the pre-Socratics, has been focused on trying to develop universal ethics. Universal ethics. And white culture is generally alone in that, in that other cultures generally have very strong in-group preferences. In other words, us good, them bad. We good, you bad. I think of Judaism with the Goyim, you think of Islam with the Kafirs. It's all over the place. The untouchables in India, the caste system. These two systems cannot mix. Universalism and in-group preferences cannot mix because every time these two groups conflict, come into conflict, the in-group preference team will win because they don't pass to the other side. So they don't lose control of this, the ball, the state, the political power, the, the, the media, the culture, the narrative. I last traveled to England, um, I guess about 15 years ago, I was working on a novel that was set in the British countryside and I wanted to go and um, observe and absorb and all of that. So I rented a cottage and it was lovely. It was lovely. I will never... My history has been torn out by the roots. I was going to, my wife is a Greek, and uh, I was a Greek background, and uh, we were going to go and visit Europe this summer. I wanted to visit the famous spots of Greek philosophy. We wanted to visit Ireland, or it's as known these days, the Emerald Isle of Somalia. And we were going to visit London, England, where I grew up. I will not. We will not, and Europe needs to know this. I've talked to a lot of people. And a lot of people I've talked to say, not going, not going. There is a boycott of Europe going on at the moment for reasons that Europeans in their heart of hearts, perhaps in their two o'clock wake-ups and their growing panic that is crashing into the politically correct fears, 
of being a bigot, a racist, of being alienated by the other. The Europeans know why. I can't go back. And that's a real shame. It's a real shame. British culture has uh, endured for at least 2,000 years, you could argue, going back further. And it's not over. But there is a time for calm and there is a time to not be calm. I think you know which time it is now.